<laughs> well, how are you doing, Princess? Prep Princess? No, I'm doing good, relatively speaking. Um, I need to keep my body shaved so I have a better idea of where my composition is. Like, I just shave and I, like, I realize how vascular I actually am because obviously, like, I don't know what it is about like hair follicles, but it's for some reason it makes the veins deeper, and the skin look not as thin. Um, so, like, I just shaved up and I was like, damn like i'm super vascular right now and my skin's really thin you were, and you were the other week walking around with your shirt off oh i mean i i'm probably down like another three pounds since then like i dropped two pounds i weighed down at 198 on wednesday i think it was like two days after john cut me down a little bit more um and like i just need to keep walking is my big thing because i haven't been I've been lazy and I've been getting sleep, but I've been getting really good sleep. So that's going to be the best thing for burning fat anyways, uh, because the cortisol response and essentially uh, I've just been doing cycling, but cycling is like not the same as walking. I don't know what it is about walking, but walking seems to be like the most beneficial always to me for prep. Yeah. So I need to be better about it. Well, perfect segue, you, you guys, cycle? because we're saying? talking about competition prep today. Oh, yeah. So Welcome everybody to the second episode for Coach's Corner. And today I have the pleasure of bringing back David, my husband, and Kenneth Almond, who's also an online coach and bodybuilding competitor. And we've all gotten several questions over, you know, the past few weeks and years about competition prep, what it's like for us. And so we thought today would be a great opportunity to dive in not only to me and Kenneth's experiences in prep, but David's in prep right now. So talking about what he's going through to date and some of our previous experiences. So it's probably going to be a two part series because of how many different great questions that we have gotten you guys. Um, but today I want to focus more on some overarching questions of our prep history and what it's been like specifically for us. So the first question I'm going to kind of turn it over to Kenneth to get started is what has been your hardest prep experience to date? Tilapia and broccoli for eight weeks. Every did you really do that? Meal. Yeah. Wow. It was, it was every single meal, tilapia and broccoli. I think my, <clears throat> my calories were like 1400 calories a day. I had two hours of cardio. Um, I had, it was pre, you know, it was fasted in post. And then, um, yeah, it was horrible. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about how many preps you've done, like how many different competitions you've done. Only a few. Um, so I am uh, less experienced than you guys. I have, uh, I've had life experiences hit me. Uh, in the midst of getting ready for shows and stuff like that. So um, I've started some and stopped some and hopefully <clears throat> this time with John, it'll be a little bit more consistent. And so it's uh, I'm not as seasoned as you guys are. <laughs> That's all right. We all have our experiences. But I put a lot, of, a lot of clients through prep and I deal with their emotions. So you feel <laughs> like you're... <laughs> like you're in prep too absolutely <laughs> david i know you've had several difficulties in preps <laughs> what would you say is your hardest prep experience yeah so i can one-up kenneth actually <laughs> um you know you can i can't say you? i can one-up you in calories actually yeah watch this so you'll like you'll like this one um actually yeah i one-up you so um Essentially, I didn't do tilapia because we already knew my body just didn't respond well to tilapia. Um, it's kind of was my thing after I graduated college that I didn't need to eat tilapia anymore because it wasn't like completely broke that I was um, would never do tilapia. So that was my thing. Um, I also couldn't eat broccoli, but at the end of the day, I couldn't eat <laughs> vegetables either. Um, so you'll like the end of this story and how it ends with vegetables. So 2016 nationals was the hardest prep of my life. Um, definitely nothing else comes close to it. Last prep was really bad, but um, it wasn't nearly as bad as this. And you said I'm a seasoned uh, competitor. To be honest, uh, this is going to be my third national show, but I've only done five shows total. 
Uh, well, two- I mean, I can I actually consider that preseason just because some people bow out after a couple. You know, some people go straight to nationals. Um, you know, if you're if you've done five or six sh- shows, it's not it's not your first walk in the park. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And I mean, it was six years in really when I truly started competing. Well, yeah, about six years into my actual training, right? So about halfway through my entire training career, actually over halfway through, uh, which I attribute most of my muscle growth actually due to taking that off time. Now, let me jump back on topic. So worst prep is uh, 2016 nationals and I could not drop weight. And at that time, I want you to remember that there was a 13 pound drop from where it is now in classic physique. So my weight class was 177, 177, actually 182. Um, so again, yeah. tell me what your height is now. So now. It's five, eight, your height and your weight now. So five, eight and a quarter is my height. My weight class now is 190. Yeah. Uh, on Wednesday, I weighed in at 198 and I'm five weeks out. So it's smooth sailing the lowest I've ever weighed during a prep as close to a prep. Now, you could just during pull this water prep, and be on stage. What was that? You could just pull water and be on stage. Exactly. Yeah, I could literally just pull water and be on stage. So um, now that prep, I could not drop weight. So we just reduced more and more and more. And then I went to trace fats, no carbs. Very similar to you, right? Um, I was doing probably an hour and a half of cardio a day, I want to say. I can't remember my exact cardio amount. Um, and I think I was stair mastering, if I remember correctly. So it was an hour and a half straight of stair mastering. That was me. Yeah. Two hours so of stair mastering. It's uh, pretty brutal. And then as I am going through the prep, um, still can't drop weight. So at the end, I was just so famished. I couldn't function by the end of it that we added cabbage as a filler. And I already couldn't really eat vegetables, right? Like green beans weren't digesting well and stuff like that. And he's like, well, we'll do cabbage for volume. Actually, not that bad of a choice, minus the fact I have IBS. So two weeks out from the show, uh, we realized that there's um, a leak coming from the apartment above. So we called the complex and we're like, hey, look, there's water pouring into our apartment right now. Can you fix it? And what ended up happening was they ended up coming in, opening the ceiling without telling us. And later on that night, I looked up and I was like, oh, they, they fixed the ceiling. But I woke up in the middle of the night, and my my nose and my my nose is bleeding, and my ears are just ringing, and I, my body felt like it was on fire from the inside out, black mold, 100% black mold. I knew exactly what it was, and my sister woke up too. We were living together. Uh, my sister woke up with the same exact symptoms, like her ears were ringing. It felt like a bomb blew up in your head, and uh, immediately, like uh, my dad lived like 30 minutes away, so I drove to my dad's and stayed at his place. But it was already done. The damage was done to the nervous system. So it triggered my IBS. On top of it triggering my IBS, um, I ended up throwing up blood and having blood coming out of my nose for 48 to 72 hours, triggered my IBS because it attacks the nervous system. And then I just skyrocketed in weight. I think I put on, I want to say like 10 to 15 pounds within that week, over a week period of time. I couldn't pass anything like I couldn't sit on like I would sit on the toilet and nothing was coming out um because of the IBS attack so we ended up I ended up driving out to my coaches and um you know it's gonna you're gonna laugh but I hate smoking weed and this is the first time he's like dude I don't care you're taking a hit before you leave just one little hit and uh sure enough I take a hit calm down the IBS normalized me um and I did hopped on the Stairmaster for two hours Hold off weight like that, right? So is, is this a, a, a political uh, push to get weed legalized in Atlanta over there? <laughs> no, no. I, I'm a huge believer in CBD. Just, I think CBD I'm does exactly – yeah. I think CBD does exactly what uh, marijuana does as far as the medical uses for it. I think there's different uses. Um, sure. there, there definitely is, like as far as pain-killing effects and stuff like that. Like the, yeah, that, the that actual – the way it did. Yeah, as far as you needing the THC, um, like there's different uses for it. But yeah. as far as uh, cannabinoids go, cannabinoids are phenomenal for pretty much everything, um, like mo- most symptoms. Either way, so um, normalized me, and then I had another week to get ready, right? I, I only did one day of posing for the show and put together a posing routine with a guy named Steve Payne, really nice guy. Um, 
And he was kind of looking after me when I went down to nationals because I was no one else there. So go down to nationals, um, a week early, took a week off of work and hung out with my best friend on South beach because he lived in Miami at the time. And then like just doing my cardio, my training regimen and always, I couldn't, I wasn't sleeping by this point for like two months or so. And what ended up happening was I stepped on the scale four days out, no, three days out from weigh-ins and I was 22 pounds heavier than my weight class. So, um, I, uh, threw the hell out of myself and I was doing cardio. I was sleeping max one hour a day if I was lucky. And I was doing cardio 4 a.m. to 8 a.m., waking up, going to the gym, training. Why are you a bodybuilder? Why are you, why are you still here? I don't understand. Do, uh, doing cardio. Dude, I uh, – so IBS attack triggered, by the way. So I wasn't passing again at this point. Um, and obviously, I didn't, didn't travel down with, like, weed or anything. So I didn't have any – a source, resource for it. And uh, I'm like, how am I going to pass? I was like, if I can't pass, I'm not making weight. So what ends up happening is uh, my best friend ends up uh, going to his girlfriend's place at the time. They're now married and sleeping over there. And I passed out. I finally got sleep, slept for like six hours or something like that. I woke up. I can't make this up. It was like an awesome powers when he's standing there peeing after he gets cryogenically unfrozen. Um, peeing in the toilet for like probably 10 minutes or so, maybe 15 <laughs> minutes is like how it felt. And it probably wasn't that long, but it was probably a five minute long pee. <laughs> Fell back asleep for like another hour, right? And I did an emergency bowel movement where you take your fingers and you basically dig it into your uh, your intestines and you like move it around like this. Woke up about 30 minutes later to an hour later and passed. I stepped on the scale the next day and weighed 12 pounds less. And I made, ended up making my weight. So it was like 10 pounds probably the first day. And I ended up excreting out about 10 pounds. Oh, wow. um, so I ended up making my weight class and I was so pale because I'm pretty sure what ended up happening is the blood left my, like the pigmentation that was near my skin, like all the blood flushed into the organs to make sure that I didn't die. Um, so that's, uh, that was my crazy story. And I was, like I said, during that prep, I was at like 200 grams of protein. So it was 800 calories a day for, I, th- I want to say like a month, to a month and a half. Yeah, that's crazy. So and I think I got, I, I, sorry, I did get some refeeds in there. Like two or three refeeds, I think. And that was it. So I will, I will tell you one thing the, about that particular prep. So there was a point where I, it felt like I had blacked out and I pulled into this soft serve ice cream place. And the next thing that I knew is that I had eaten an entire tub of like soft serve ice cream with all the toppings and stuff on it. And I called my coach sort of like in a panic, it was only like three or four weeks out. And I was like, I don't know, man. Like, I don't remember it. I don't remember like even pulling in the parking lot. And I'm, I'm literally, I have two feet out of my car with the bowl in my hands, empty on the phone with my coach, almost weeping. And, uh, he's like, Kenneth, it's going to be okay. You're probably, (laughs) you're probably going to wake up tomorrow and look like a million dollars. So just, it's going to be okay. And sure enough, I woke up the next day and I look great, I, but <laughs> man, it messed me up, boy. I was, I thought I ruined everything. Okay. So I, Caroline, I need to play off that story really fast. So this is when Caroline moved down here to end up moving in with me. Right. And I was at my mom's place because we had like a week or two week intermission before our apartment lease started. And, uh, I was three days out for my show. Uh, she came down the week of my show and either way I'm, uh, I wake up the next day and I'm driving into work and I have like a weird texture in my mouth. Right. I'm like, what the hell is that? And then like, it, it's like a sugary feeling. I'm like, okay. And then all of a sudden, like I had like a flashback of like the bottom of an ice cream tub container and just like a little piece left. Right. Like literally I was like, what the heck? Okay. Text Caroline. I'm like, Hey, can you just check the freezer for me really fast? Like, please. And, um, uh, she's, I was like, check the ice cream container. And she's like, what? I'm like, just let me know if it's empty or not. And she's like, there's like a bite left. I'm like, no. <laughs> uh, yeah. Black and out eating ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> I will never forget that because it was literally like, 
I can't believe that he did this. And we live right, we had been living right up the street from a new ice cream shop that had just opened up too. And I'd been talking about wanting to go there. <laughs> right. So, and he, he eats all the ice cream in the house. Right. <laughs> yeah. So needless to say, it sounds like you two were prepping for a bikini back in those preps, but uh, I can't yeah. say <laughs> I've ever had anything as crazy as you guys. I also haven't ever had my calories that low. So thank God. Um, I've actually done, I just totaled it up. I've done eight shows in the past five years. And so of those shows last year, my last figure prep going into Junior USA's was probably the hardest on me from a mental and physical standpoint. I was working a full-time job, same company I'm with now, and it's a 30 minute commute in the mornings, but I'd have to get up at 4.45 to do 70 minutes of cardio, be able to shower, put some makeup on, put clothes on, get out the door. You're doing 70 fasting? Yeah. Wow. So actually, I take that back. I was doing 50 fasted and then 15 post-workout hit. So that um, that was during my prep from figure. Now, the hardest part was that lack of sleep because I would be getting up so early and I wouldn't get to bed until like 11. And I, you know, when you're on any type of stimulants or performance enhancers, you're not sleeping well. My sleep was terrible. I don't, I didn't smoke or anything to try and relax. My body just typically takes some sleep aids. So from a mental physical standpoint, that was hard. And then David was prepping as well. And just for me, the amount of stress to prep myself and then help him on top of that was just like a compound effect. So to be honest, like, like you guys said, I don't think I've ever had like the issues with the food like that. Like I actually am really good as far as like the amount of calories I'm able to eat or not suffer too much when I get to a thousand or slightly below a thousand calories, which is usually only like the last three to four weeks. So actually on that note of food, Um, one of the questions that we had gotten was what are some of our cravings and how do we overcome cravings? And I'll actually touch on it first. So usually the only cravings I get is for different textures. So I typically like crunchy foods or I'm really craving like salt or I'm craving something that's like more fluffy consistency, especially if I'm you know, eating turkey, avocado, and vegetables. How do you change that up? Right. Air fryer was the number one thing that's changed my world. Best Christmas gift, Christmas gift David's ever given me <laughs> because I literally use it every single day. And like for sweet potatoes, I couldn't eat regular baked sweet potatoes. I put them in the air fryer and I make fries yeah, or yeah. my, my vegetables, throw them in the air fryer and I make David asparagus fries for prep right now. So like those types of things that I can change up the texture. um, I actually uh, enjoy that more. And when I'm trying to like overcome some of those cravings, it's just like, how do you experiment a little bit in the kitchen? And I'm lucky that I'm pretty good cook and baker that I can do that. What about you, Kenneth? So I I think it's weird. uh, Probably almonds, believe it or not. (laughs) it's like if i in a particular diet i had like where you could have like only 12 or something and um i would want the whole bag or i'd want half the bag um so that was probably the weirdest craving of course you want a burger and fries or whatever um depending on what's going on but nothing crazy just I'm pretty, in fact, I look back at some of the times I've dieted and the amount of focus that I had was so significant that sometimes I look in my regular life and I'm like, where, where did I pull that from? And why can't I get that right now? (laughs) Because I need to get my act together. But yeah, nothing crazy, you know, but if I got on Instagram and follow those food, food porn, you know, pages then it would be 10 times worse or i would catch myself with friends like oh man i saw this mac and cheese on the instagram page it was amazing 
and all you know is that you're talking about food with your friends and that's all you talk about it's really weird Mm -hmm. everybody likes to have something to have in common so I actually have to block the food pages during prep or hide them (laughs) because I follow a lot of baked good pages so (laughs) I get a lot of sweet cravings too what about you David what are you craving right now craving raisins no I'm just fine (laughs) Um, honestly, like my cravings, I've been doing this so long to the point where I've never been a sweet craving person. It's very, very uncommon that I crave sweets unless I'm pregnant, which I've never been pregnant. So, um, on that note, um, burgers, you just just crave a win, right? Is that what it is? You're just craving a win. Yeah, exactly. Like I'm like, well, this time I'm really hungry for a win. Like I'm actually hungry for this win like where i know i'm coming in full steam full steam ahead um and there's like no stopping me kind of thing i'm going to bring my best and if i lose i lose you know but it's it's going to be um it's going to be a pretty solid package what i pulled together this time but now uh as far as craving goes like it's always going to be red meat for me um red meat has always just been my advice i'm really really i respond really well to red meat and I think that's the reason why um, I'm an O blood type. I digest it very well. I can eat three pounds of red meat a day and not have any digestion issues, which is very uncommon for people. My blood works always fine when I do it. Um, like if I have, uh, I'm not even going to go into too many details, but yeah, so that's, that's my craving. Um, I crave salty foods, um, but I do ne- I never crave sweets. So I can always add more salt to my meals and I very heavily season my meals. You can ask Caroline, Caroline, couldn't cook for me for the first two years we were dating because she wouldn't season my food heavily enough. And I'm like, put salt on it. And I'm like, every single time she cooked. Let me, let me tell you a quick story. So I used to love my oatmeal. Um, and I only got the oatmeal at a certain point in the diet. Right. And then that came out and that's like really sad. It is sad for some of my clients too, because that, that happens to them. And, um, but I used to season it with cinnamon and, the oatmeal would get so dark from the cinnamon that it was like, a, it, it almost changed texture. Mm-hmm. Well, I was dating a girl at one point and um, I'm eating oatmeal and she's like, well, I'd like some oatmeal. I was like, okay, I'll fix you some. So I fixed it the way that I fix it for her. And she literally took a bite of it. She was like, there's something wrong with you. Like that is the nastiest stuff I've ever tasted in my life. Because the cinnamon was so strong. I bet I bet I put like, I don't know, four or five tablespoons of cinnamon in my one cup of oatmeal. But I, you didn't even taste it on prep. It was, you were like, oh, this is great. I don't know why. You ever had that happen? Yeah. So um, I was going to say when I did have a sweet craving, because in my first few preps, I think I had a sweet craving. My, maybe my first two or three max. Maybe my third. I can't remember if I had it in my third. Um but uh, stevia, liquid stevia just came out. So stevia and cinnamon was my vice. And like a lot of trick that I will give people is cucumber, cinnamon, and stevia, period. Like that's the best. Now I'm the opposite where I want salt. So I do cucumber and salt. And as long as I'm getting my yeah. salt intake, I need to have salt on food. You don't want to add salt into a drink. That That's like drinking the ocean water. Um so needless to say, that's the kind of go-to that I give people is like cinnamon and stevia is an excellent combination for really knocking a sweet craving. Cinnamon tastes sweet alone if you add it into something, but then stevia is literally sweeter than refined sugar anyway. So you don't need a lot and it goes a very, very long way And the conjunction of the two is phenomenal. So. Yeah, it's very fun how you can – kind of trick your mind when you're eating different foods so on that note there was another question that we got about how do you control that hunger or appetite and one thing that works for me is I try to number one you drink a ton of water and obviously you don't really need to cut water until getting ready to show but number two something that is a trick of mine is I like to do teas and I like to do crystal light Um, throughout the day to change up the flavor because that's usually what it is for me is I don't want to drink plain water all day but if I do like a cup of peppermint tea after I eat a meal then I'm thinking about drinking that tea instead of thinking about oh when do I get to eat again or 
maybe mid afternoon during like the work day, I'm just like dreary. I'll put a packet of crystal light. Some of them have caffeine added into them. Um, you just have to be careful with artificial sugars is from my experience. I try not to do them like the week of a show or like a week and a half before 10 days before a show. So that's something that I like to use. Yeah. Have you ever uh, experienced um, using too much crystal light or like actually that's like I've read studies where it actually provides a little bit of an insulin response in a uh, mm-hmm. very small amount. So for, for me and my clients, sometimes I'll have guys or girls that don't really, it doesn't bother them, but I have a few that they can't stand water so much that they're like Fuad, Abiyad, you know, and he like puts sweetener in everything and it actually affects their ability to drop weight. So you pull the, the crystal light out of it, it makes their life miserable, but it actually, uh, it actually works better from a diet standpoint. Have you ever had that, Caroline? Um, I myself don't typically have any issues. I did have an issue last year with a gut imbalance from eggs, and I found out I developed a food sensitivity to eggs because I was eating them so frequently. But as far as the artificial sugars go, I haven't ever tested myself or any on, on any of my clients um, no that yeah. David what can probably you, uh, chime in though. Yeah. So I can chime in on that. And what was the original question really fast? Um, it's it was basically, uh, cravings. How right? do you, yeah. How do you overcome your hunger and appetite? Yeah. So hunger and appetite. Um, the easiest way to tell yourself what's going on is understand that it's a hormone response. It's literally a hormone that tells you, you are hungry, you need to eat. So if you understand the science behind it, that it's literally a hormone that's telling you to eat, you know you can overcome it because of mental state by that point. It's a, literally a hormone telling you, you're hungry, you should eat. Um, so that being the fact is, as long as you keep your stomach full with water, like I actually only do water besides like my first drink of the day when I have some greens and some of my anti-inflammatory stuff and it's all all mixed up and adaptogens mixed together um that works well for me now when i get really bad cravings if i i am blessed with the opportunity where if i get really bad and i feel like a rat's clawing out my stomach and i'm not hungry i'm gonna have some water and i'm gonna lay down and take a nap and i'm gonna wake up and i'm gonna have another meal because that's kind of been my go-to this prep and it's been working relatively well not everyone has that option as far as crystal light, yeah, I, I can definitely touch on that subject. Dropping weight becomes an issue. Um, there is a, I'm not sure. So I've never seen studies where there's an insulin response, right? But I feel like there is an insulin response, if that makes sense. Now, in the sense where there is a gastric feedback from the crystal light and it can cause gut distress. When you get gut distress, you can get inflammation in the gut. So it's going to make it hard to drop weight, especially when your gut is imbalanced and you're retaining inflammation within the body and that's extra fluid. So on the scale, it will represent itself definitely. Um, I have had issues with my gut. The most I was able to ever to do crystal light was half a crystal light packet a day. And I have not needed it this prep. I'm staying away from it this prep. I'm not touching it. Um, so that's my stance on crystal light. I think it's one of those things like for a craving, you kind of just need to suck it up and drink water and like find a way to get your mind off of being hungry and just understand that it's your, it's a hormone that's telling you that you're hungry. It's not that you have to eat. That's what we're conditioned to think all the time. And if all that you're doing is you're not eating a lot of food, of course, you're like, oh, when's my next meal? Oh, when's my next meal? Instead of thinking, oh, when's my next meal? Just understand, okay, I've got to tough it out for another like, hour or so what am i going to do to detain my mind for that time and that's it drink drink some water yeah it's actually um a good point about that david is keeping your mind busy and i actually find that because i'm in a work office and a work situation packing my meals every day and only having those certain amount of meals to think about and knowing that that's all i get to eat is super helpful for me and like another tip actually I think I was the first one to do this, David, and then you started picking up on it, is using like a baby spoon to eat because then you're eating smaller (laughs) bites. 
and you don't even think about it and you can enjoy the food a little bit longer. You know, so it's funny because I think I may have done it last prep with uh, sugar-free Jello. Sugar-free Jello is my vice last time, um, and this time I'm not doing that either. I'm just staying away from it. I mean, that I feel like I do have an insulin response to of some sort. Um, needless to say, I used to do it at nighttime before bed, and I just stopped doing it altogether. Um, but yeah, the baby spoon is what I used for that because I would get like more uses out of it, so I didn't have to cook as much Jello. Is really what the reasoning behind it, but. As far as using a baby spoon this time, I haven't needed to, um, and I'm not eating that much food right now anyways, but I just get it in and understand like I'm not going to eat for X amount of time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So another question, it's kind of um, a different topic that we'll focus on next is more on the training and how you feel like your strength changes throughout the prep. And so I'll go ahead and start for me is I know like there's certain points in the prep where all of a sudden my strength, it goes from up here feeling like I'm off season to plummets to feeling like I'm back to amateur one year into the training. Mm -hmm. And it's usually like, I want to say like seven to eight weeks out is when I really start to feel it. But also that's usually when the cardio is getting amped up. If you're adding in any special supplementation, that's usually when that's added in. And a lot of times that's when your body is really starting to feel and see those physical changes. So I think that's usually for me, like my training, I don't change my training. I'm still doing more of like a progressive overload style of training, but I notice I, Yeah. Okay. And I still try and keep that volume load at a certain amount, but I have to decrease the weights. What about yeah. you guys? Yeah, for me, um, I, it depends on how many drugs you're on, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, if, if you're on a decent amount of drugs, I've even seen clients strength increase and you have to, you know, hold them back and tell them don't go balls to the wall with the weight you know, keep your rep ranges higher. Um, you're trying to train the muscle for depletion and you're not really gaining muscle in particular phases. But um, I would agree with you, Caroline, from like an eight week standpoint, but <clears throat> that four weeks out, it's pretty, uh, pretty bad if you're not, sub you know, you're not doing drugs or supp supplementing correctly. Um, but I've seen, I've seen some guys go from, I don't know, pretty freaky stuff and being pretty freaky lean, um, four weeks out. So I always try to keep, keep a rein on them. Mm -hmm. David. Um, yeah. So my last prep was a different story than this one, but that's a week I've ever felt my entire life. Um, I peaked like three months out. So, uh, this prep. I can speak to kind of the drug aspect and how I feel considering I don't really do anything in the off season. Like a lot of people do. Um, I was also recovering from surgery, so there's no reason for me to. Now I started my prep at 5,000 calories and I was burning through body fat. Um, and then he just reduced me down just to reduce me down, even though I was still burning because I have a weight cap to hit. Now, I started prep at 365, I want to say, for like a set of eight on squats, maybe two sets of eight. When I was four weeks into prep, so eight weeks out, I was doing 455 for two sets of eight. And my calories were reduced by 2,000 from the start. So I was at a 3,000 calorie. So 2,000 calorie drop from the start uh, in those, that period of time. Sometimes when you get leaner, what from my personal experience, and you feel healthier, you're stronger 100% of the time. Like the power lifters that just get morbidly obese to be stronger, if they were leaner, I guarantee you they'd be stronger. Um, it's less pressure on the heart. You feel more athletic. Your breathing habits are better. Um, not to say that inertia is not a thing, but um, either way, uh, I have been getting stronger. Now, I will say if the 455 for eight um, was almost an injury, like it was very, very close to an injury borderline, um, but that's the most I'd ever done was 455 for two sets of eight. 
And then like yesterday I was doing legs and I did the routine was Bulgarian. I, I went to the gym with the incentive because I had the back squats for a third you movement. A video, you posted a video or something yesterday, right on it. Yeah. Or yeah. On. So it, that, you saw that protocol, right? So it was leg curls yeah, to yeah. start. Bulgarian split yeah. squats of death, which you're pretty much toast by. And I had intentions. If I could get 315 on squats for multiple sets and reps, I was going to be happy. I ended up doing four or five for my sets. And then I went to hack squats. And now my hack squats, I converted over to sissy squats because I was shot by that point. But still getting four or five for sets of eight. Um, and that's saying something, especially since it's not my first movement of the day. And that 455 was my first movement of the day. This is my, as after Bulgarian split squat. So I'm technically increasing my volume load. Um, I think the biggest mistake that people make is they reduce their volume load too much during a prep and they flatten out. Their muscles look stringy. They're not full. They're not right. dense. If you want dense muscle bodies, you got to lift as heavy as you can for as long as you can without tearing something. If you can be two weeks out like Ronnie Coleman deadlifting 800 pounds, which I just don't recommend to anyone, then do it. But Ronnie Coleman was Ronnie Coleman, right? Hold he could have gotten more. On. We can't. We can't be talking like that, David. Nah. Not, we can't. We can't. Not, not with people. Not with people listening. They're gonna be like, "Well, David told me to be Ronnie, Ronnie Coleman." <laughs> and the next thing we know, we've got injuries on our on our hands. And I'm like, "No, nah, man. Like, listen to okay. your coach. That's what I would yeah. say. Listen to your coach because he knows your so, body well, or she. So here's the thing. Oh, right. uh, she like, knows, yeah. Look at your off season, whatever you're doing in your off season, right? Without supplementation at all, no drugs involved. What you're doing in your off season without supplementation is very safe to do on season with supplementation, with super subs. That is where I like to keep it. I can do 405, 365 to 405 any given day of the week on a squat. That's where I know I am safe. My body's used to the stress load. I'm not going to get injured. I'm going to be slow. I'm going to be controlled. If you can't be slow and controlled, back off the weight because you're going to rip something. As soon as you're not slow and controlled in a movement period, back off the load. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. I just did I, You know how I'm hyped up? They're like, David told me to do something. I'm going to do it. <laughs> you know, next thing we know, then we got DMs, you know, people sliding our DMs going, yeah, well, I tore, uh, I tore a calf, I tore, I tore a quad or and, you know, it's like, oh, my gosh, what in the world did David do? So, so to add on to that point, Kenneth, David <laughs> needs to listen to this piece is, yes, you do need to train with that intensity and that high frequency and heavier weights. But that's where you need to find the balance in the stretching and helping those muscles lengthen. And David can attest to this. He's had injuries within this prep because he did not stretch enough or he didn't take the time to take care of the muscles in between sets or after the workout. I've gotten a lot better about it in off season. I'm better at it in off season than I am during just because I go into the gym with the mindset of in an hour to an hour and a half, I'm crushing it. I don't want to spend extra time in the gym because number one, you're exhausted and I just want to go home from the long day. So for yeah. me, taking 10 minutes at the end of the workout is worth that extra 10 minutes just so that I can prevent injury and I can increase the chance of muscle gains. Okay. So I, I can add on to the stretching point. Um, I do a lot of dynamic stretching, especially on leg days before I lift. Um, I'm very, very good about dynamic stretching pre-workout post-workout. I'm not as good unless if I have an extension in my protocol, which I actually don't have a lot of extensions in my protocols. It's like maybe an every other week thing. And I'll do um, basically, I'm, I want to call it occlusion stretching. Um, it just, I, you basically kick the leg up as soon as you're done with your set and you stretch it out. That's about the only time when I stretch. There's a lot of internal stretching that happens when you're hitting your hamstrings and your quads back to back to back. Um, but that being said is we were talking about actually training and the workload. So there's a catch 22 between how much volume you can put on your legs and how much cardio can be done. So I would rather give someone less cardio, diet them down, and if I need to add more supplements in so that they can still optimize their volume from their legs because legs at the end of the day is the most important thing for core, for overall physique, for performance. Um, so it's very, very important that your legs stay intact. So you need stretching on your legs, period. I don't care what else. 
I highly recommend stretching your chest out also because usually that chest, that front delt gets too tight and you're going to eventually have a rotator cuff tear or a labrum tear, which I already experienced a labrum tear. It wasn't due to bad form or not being flexible, but it definitely could have attributed to it. Um, so that would be like definitely something to note from a coach's perspective is cardio versus leg day and how much volume can be optimized because you can have a woman on three, three leg days a week and on the off season, on the on season, there's going to be a give and take on that. You're going to have to reduce it down to probably two days. a week, Especially depending on how much cardio and what type of cardio she's doing. And that's where I found for me and some other women that I've worked with is you can't do as much hit training especially if you're focused on the legs, whether it's bikini wellness, uh, I think figure and women's physique, you do need to have some type of hit, whether it's during that leg session or post-workout to help with that muscle separation and getting more of the striations in the legs because they don't need as big of legs and as shapely of legs, but in wellness and bikini, you don't need to have as much separation. separation. That's just going to come from dieting down. So, I mean, uh, I'm going to con con contradict that women's physique statement. Women's physique should be training like bodybuilders. Um, it's essentially bodybuilding just with not as much mass for women. So I think that it's going to be pretty heavy, hard training. I don't think that they need to hit training. I think low intensity training with some heavy movements is going to get that really dense muscle fiber look. So that's just my personal opinion. Mm -hmm. So Caroline, um, do you, do you find that when you're working with girls, um, it could be just too stressful. Absolutely. I'll yeah. tell you my personal experience, my first ever preps, I was doing hit training as my cardio six days a week. And I would either do Stairmaster with intervals of 30 seconds, hard one minute to one thirty, like medium, or I was doing rows for 30 minutes going up in intensity for like, I forget how many meters I had to hit. It was like a hundred meters and then I would rest and then I do it again and do like a pyramid effect. My CNS is blown out. And that was probably part of the reason that I lost my period and had issues with that for a few yeah. years. But to your point, like women can handle a high stress load, but when you add the other effects from a prep, there just comes a point and every woman's got a different um, level that she can manage. The CNS is a uh, central nervous system. So basically the central nervous system is everything. It, it's our nervous system in general. If you put the nervous system into overdrive, then your, your body essentially will shut down and you'll go to sleep. Like you have to sleep. I've had my central nervous system shut down so hard to the point where I literally was in bed, bedridden for three days straight where I could not get out of bed. Um, I was having, I can't make this up. This is off season, but um, I, I couldn't even get up to cook food, put food together. I called the pizza restaurant across the street and had them deliver pizza and had Caroline deliver me pizza in bed because I couldn't even get out of bed. I mean, that uh, just sounds like David being David, but that's just Yeah, probably. It has like a peak on how much stress her brain can think is okay before it switches off thinking you're trying to kill yourself we're not going to let you have a baby. We're not going to let you lose body fat. Yep. So if you, and every woman's different, you don't really find, figure out what that threshold is until you understand your body and you take time to learn your body and a coach takes time to learn your body. A hundred percent. Um, so with my athletes, same exact thing. Um, women tend to have a higher cortisol response than most men, not all the time, but most of the time you get to find out that th threshold. Sometimes people are better off training three days a week than four or five days a week. And that's all there is to it. Sometimes people can train five days a week and do cardio three days a week. And that's where they need to be. Um, it's all dependent on the person. It's very, very complex when it comes to it because more at a hormone level than it, it's at a CNS and it level essentially, but it affects the hormones differently. And females are just more hormonal creatures than males period. I don't care what anyone says. Yes. They're meant to handle a high stress load due to childbirth and stuff like that. But that being said is they tend to have, from my personal experience, a higher cortisol response. And once you become insulin resistance due to a cortisol response,
goodbye to dropping body fat. And congratulations, you now have an insulin resistant client that you're now going to have to recover because you're probably pre diabetic. And insulin oh, wow. resistance is the number one cause of PCOS. So you're going to have all these different layers and is acronym for a polycystic ovarian syndrome, which a lot of people think it's development of cysts in the ovaries, which is actually incorrect. Essentially the ovaries and the um, reproductive system of the woman, when it becomes overstressed from one of many different types of causes, creating inflammation in the ovaries, essentially the Um, ovaries start to lose and disconnect connection to the brain, which is what causes the menses and the menstrual cycle. So it can cause issues, whether it's you're losing your period, it's causing irregular bleeds, it's causing weight gain, it's causing mood and um, irregularity to um, your overall like composition and the way that you're activity level is, um, feeling low fatigue. So PCOS in general is something that is actually one of the most common symptoms that women can get based on their hormones and their energy, but also their food intake. So there's a lot that goes into it, but at a surface level, essentially it's a disconnect between the brain and your reproductive system as a woman. We haven't touched on in this episode, which if you guys want to, we can dive in deeper in another uh, series, is the addition of the PEDs because Mm -hmm. certain women are going to respond normal, like they're just a day in the life. And other women, they're going to get more anxiety. They're going to get more inflammation. Maybe if they're taking something that's a faked product, you're going to get holding on to water, you're going to have a whole boatload of issues come up that are affecting that hypothalamus ovarian axis. Would you just, oh, perfect. But um, one last thing I wanted to touch on today, we've gone over quite a bit, and I think this has been a really good in-depth session, and we'll touch on some more in part two. But what would you guys say is one of the things that whether it's a brand new competitor or somebody who's just getting into competing or a seasoned vet, what would you say is that one thing, and I'm limiting you guys to one, the one thing that will make or break somebody in a competition prep? You I'll mean, go ahead. Uh, you go mean ahead. Um, like... I guess to be a little bit more specific, you're just saying there's got, there's probably one thing that is just going to make them fail. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. And I'll go ahead and start so you guys can think on it. But for me, it's having that self-discipline. And that's where like the past five years before Dave and I were a thing, which a lot of people don't realize this was both he and I did bodybuilding separate before we even knew each other. And I was actually living in Nebraska when I first started bodybuilding. I didn't have anybody new out there who was doing the sport or understood the sport really. And so I had to have in my head, I had to develop this, this fortitude, this mindset of this is my goal. I have to do these certain things to achieve this goal. And yes, I've always been disciplined, but I, I think that bodybuilding alone has developed more of that discipline within me. And there's a lot of competitors or want to be competitors that I've met and they can't stick to a diet or they're cheating themselves during a workout and they only give 50, 60% of their capacity during a workout or their cardio sessions are pretty mediocre or they're not sleeping. And then they all want to rely on drugs. And I honestly feel like it's that self-discipline that is what makes or breaks somebody. It's not necessarily the specific diet. It's not the specific training methods. It's not the specific coaching program. But if you yourself can't have discipline and drive to want this goal, nobody else is going to do it for you. Yeah, I I think you're right on the money. Um, I also think mindset is uh, the main thing for me when I work with somebody, um, when I do a, uh, onboarding call, 
we talk about mindset, we talk about expectations. So if my expectations are higher than what this individual may have in mind um, for themselves, they either need to meet the expectation with their mindset and trust me. And that's another piece is like the, there's the trust with the coach, right? Um, because when you're in the depths of the prep, the only person you can really talk to, hopefully, is your coach. And they're either going to direct you towards like winning or, you know, losing. So, uh, and a lot of times if you don't listen to them and it's not an open conversation, like for example, I even have a guy right now where we're learning his body because we've only done so much time together. When we have a show about four, three or four weeks out and, uh, so he's like, I can eat more food. And I'm like, can you? And, you know, it's kind of like a debate back and forth, but it's an open debate. And, it, and he has a mindset of trusting me. So we'll do something. And <clears throat> if he feels uncomfortable with something or whatever, he feels comfortable enough to come back to me and say, hey, this is how I felt. Can we make a tweak? And then I'll make the tweak. And then we kind of learn it together. But that takes a really special client. Um, somebody that knows their body, somebody that's really self-aware, somebody that's an elite athlete. Um, on a base level, though, with the new person, mindset of I've got to trust my coach. I've got to do what the plan says. I've got to uh, be resilient. I think that would probably be the most, the one thing or several things. Sorry, mm -hmm. you've limited me to one. <laughs> it's all good. Yeah, so um, I'm just, it's, this is kind of like a two part question. So, first one, good coach. You need to be able to confide in your coach um, and tr have trust in your coach, just like Kenneth just said. So, that was my number one. But from an athlete side of it, not just f being able to follow a plan, the number one thing an athlete needs to have, not just self discipline, it's actually life balance. Because your life balance is going to go to hell during prep. Your energy buckets go to hell. Your relationships don't necessarily go to hell. You can only keep them so strong. So you need them very strong. You need all aspects of life in check. Your job. You need to make sure that you're secure and that you're doing keeping up with the workload and that your boss trusts you and that they're semi-understanding that you're going to need a week off at some point, right? Because you should take a week off during prep, uh, during your, uh, for your peak week, in my opinion because uh, it depends on how rough the prep is. Another one is the financial aspect. If you don't have your finances in check, all that you're going to be doing is stressing, do I even have enough money to get food? The other aspect, uh, we were talking about relationships. Like I said, they need to be strong. You're going to get whittled away. I get emotionally and physically numb. It's just what happens. I get spiritually more in touch, but you need to have that balance before going into prep or else you're putting the cart in front of the horse. What happens when the cart's in front of the horse? The horse is going to trip over that cart. And congratulations. Now you're on the ground and you come out of the show with literally nothing. What? A plastic trophy? Congratulations. Your life's in shambles now. All right. That's my thing. <laughs> I don't know. That, that's just blunt, but that's just the way it is. You have to have good life balance. You need to be strong because if you're not, if, your life is in shambles. <laughs> <laughs> but I've seen it time and time again where like people are like their lives are in shambles and they really, and then they start taking drugs afterwards, like after bodybuilding shows. Like it's that people tend to be, and we already touched on this last episode, but people tend to be attracted to the sport based off of hardships. And that's why it's very important to have that life balance, that spiritual balance, that emotional balance, that physical balance. All aspects need to be in check before going to the show or else your mindset can't be good. You won't have a positive outlook. You're always going to be stressing. Your core, <laughs> stress, like everything, like you've got to have everything in check before you do it. No, it but doesn't that, mean your life. That goes, back to, that goes back to number one. Your coach is really managing it at that point. And if your coach isn't managing your mindset and your life balance, then you're kind of up the creek anyway. A hundred percent. You have to be able to confide in your coach about your relationship issues and all that stuff. We're basically psychologists by this point. But well, yeah. um, 
Sure. So like, that's why I said my number one is a good coach, but from an athlete standpoint, they have to have their life in check. And if all of the ducks are row and all line and, and it's pointing in the direction towards, Hey, you can compete. You can go for it. Yeah. And I will add on to that point, David is a lot of people get into this sport and it's kind of their saving grace in a way. And so I think that's, it really depends because there's certain different, there's certain athletes that they'll come into the sport and they have everything going great in their lives. And they just add this on as this is a new goal. I'm going to do this. And then you've got the other group of people that bodybuilding becomes their life and their focus because it distracts them. And it actually gets them on a path out of that dark tunnel into fixing the other parts of their lives because they develop the habits. And to my point, self-discipline, they develop the habits here in bodybuilding, and then they're able to put them into the other areas of their lives. I can actually think of a couple of your clients that specifically started bodybuilding. The rest of their life was pretty much awful. And then from bodybuilding, you helped guide them to, Hey, have you thought about what your career is going to look like? Are you thinking about going to school? Are you thinking about taking care of a family in the future? And yes, exactly like you said, we want somebody who's coachable and we need somebody who's going to be able to depend on us to help them. But at the end of the day, like it's up to them to know and become self-aware to Ken this point of what they want and what they need and that the sport isn't the only piece of their lives that they're relying on. Kenneth, you'll like this one. So my first client I ever worked with to this day, like he was my first one, like five years ago or something like that. Um, probably coaching for like two years or so. I kept pushing school on him. He walked up to me the other day. He's like, Hey man, I haven't announced anything, but I just want to thank you. Um, I just graduated college. So he got his bachelor's degree and he thanked me so much. He's like, that's the best advice I could have ever gotten. So thank you for pushing me. He actually told me he told his mom, by the way, I graduated college because my first coach was pushing it on me and I uh, decided to st- tough it out and get through school. Yeah, that gives me some goosebumps, dude. That's pretty good. Um, it, it, it's chills, man. It, it, it brought like, I almost want to bring tears to my eyes, but too bad I'm in prep. I'm not that emotionally. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I would say that like if 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 you have a coach and they're not thinking about you holistically as a person, um, then you need to really reevaluate what's going on because everybody's leading somebody, and um, so like I'm I'm following John, I'm following some local guys, I'm those guys are leading me towards good, healthy goals and good healthy balanced lives and um and you have to be self-aware as a coach where am i leading my clients and then you have to kind of look at your clients and say who's who's following you are you paying attention anybody you know who's watching you and um so it's kind of a cycle but um yeah that's super important and such an encouraging story too that you could change somebody's life Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think even today, right, during this podcast, if there's somebody who's watching it and they get impacted by something we say or they share it with somebody and that person gets impacted by something we say, just that little incremental piece of, you know, we're possibly helping somebody, I think is the most rewarding part of the sport, but also as a coach and as a human being bringing that positive light. And David always says positivity brings more positivity. And it's true. It's the energy that you put out there is what's going to come back to you. So I think that pretty much wraps us up for today, but I think we had a great conversation, you guys, and look forward to doing the next one. Yeah, me too. Yeah, me too. So thanks. (laughs)